We are celebrating 40 years of WrestleMania, so let's take a look at how we got here. It's time for the Toonytown Wrestling WrestleMania Retrospective. Hello, I'm Marvin, and welcome to a segment I want to do yearly here on Tony Town Wrestling, the WrestleMania Retrospective, showing how we got from where we started to where we are today. It's WrestleMania week, but it's more than that. This is a major milestone WrestleMania. This is the year we celebrate the 40th consecutive WrestleMania event. So, that got me thinking about how we got here. How did we go from a closed-circuit show broadcast from Madison Square Garden to a massive two-day streaming extravaganza that has become a week-long event not just for the WWE, but for the entire pro wrestling industry? That's why I decided we needed to take a look at four different decades in WWE that paved the way toward WrestleMania 40, examining how the event, the WWE, and the wrestling business changed over time. That's right, we're examining WrestleMania 1 in 1985, WrestleMania 10 in 1994, WrestleMania 20 in 2004, and WrestleMania 30 in 2014. For each event, we'll look at things like the venue, which is going to be kind of repetitive until we get to 30, the commentary team, and the general layout of the show. Then we'll examine the match of the night, the worst match of the night, the MVP of the event, the main event, and the best story of the night before discussing my personal favorite match from the card. Let's start where it all began. WrestleMania 1 is undeniably important to the history of not just the WWE, but to professional wrestling in general. It changed the game and brought wrestling mainstream, which is either a huge positive or negative depending on your outlook on the business. The event took place in Madison Square Garden, the unofficial home of the WWE, in the heart of New York City. It's the most famous arena on the planet, and it's home to sports teams like the New York Rangers and the New York Knicks. So nobody really important. But there was no other place WrestleMania could have been. The garden was tradition and glamour and legitimacy. It was a place where celebrity guests seemed at home, and it gave WrestleMania a huge aura that it desperately needed. I don't think it can be properly conveyed how important WrestleMania was here. Vince McMahon put everything on this event. If it failed, the entire business would have crumbled. The event was shown on closed circuit television, which meant you had to actually buy a ticket to watch the show in a movie theater on the big screen. Not gonna lie, I'd love to do that now. It sounds like an amazing experience. Now, everyone knows about WrestleMania 1, but I don't think a lot of people have actually sat down to watch it. The show is, uh, different for sure. Uh, it's very much an old-school wrestling show featuring some celebrities. The layout of the show is strange, especially compared to today's product 39 years later. The show opens with Mean Gene Oakland singing the Star Spangled Banner instead of America the Beautiful as it's become the norm in later years. Howard Finkel used a house mic to ring an ounce that would lower from the ceiling. That's something not seen again in the WWE until... something that doesn't ultimately matter. Your commentary team for the night was Gorilla Monsoon and Jesse the Body Ventura. Instead of the hype-up videos and vignettes that explain storylines between matches, we got his lordship, Lord Alfred Hayes, explaining what's been happening up to this point. We also got Mean Gene doing pre-taped promos between the matches, which was common for a long time. Only here, he'd interview the heel, and then the heel would walk off, and the babyface would then come right in. So the face and the heel was standing there in the wings listening to the other cut their promo. It was definitely weird. One thing that I noticed right away was the sheer number of managers. Holy crap! You had Bobby the Brain Heenan, Captain Lou Albano, Jimmy Hart, Jimmy Valiant, Classy Freddy Blasi, the fabulous Moolah, and even Rockstar Cindy Lauper and WWE legend Bruno Sammartino were seconding wrestlers to the ring. There weren't a lot of personal issue blood feuds on this show. It was treated a lot like a sporting event with title matches galore. King Kong Bundy was on the show with a two-minute squash match that I assume was there because Vince was already building him up as a major challenger for Hogan at WrestleMania 2. Andre the Giant was on the show against Big John Studd in a body slam challenge where the only way to win was to slam your opponent. It was so fun to see Andre against Bobby Heenan as the two wouldn't come together as allies for another two years. If Andre lost, he'd retire from wrestling. And if Studd lost, then Andre got $15,000 of Studd's own money. That would be worth $43,696 today. Of course, Andre got the win here. We also had a women's title match where Wendy Richter, with Cindy Lauper at his side, defeated Leilani Kai with the fabulous Moolah. The most interesting thing here was that Leilani Kai is billed as a Hawaiian, and I don't think she could find Hawaii on a map. 
She's not Hawaiian in the least, but apparently Mula thought she looked Hawaiian. Oh, yeah. I totally see it. Bruno Sammartino was there managing his son David Sammartino against Brutus Beefcake. The crowd was deader than disco for this match until Bruno did something. If Big Bruno, the king of MSG, so much as scratched an itch on his face, the entire place exploded. That only served to demonstrate to everyone that David Sammartino clearly wasn't his daddy. The main event saw Roddy Piper and Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff teaming up against Hulk Hogan and Mr. T. Of course, this probably should have been Hogan versus Piper for the world title, but that couldn't happen as Roddy refused to actually lose to Hogan. He also refused to give Mr. T any meaningful offense in this match and hated that the Hollywood icon was in there with him. Paul Orndorff does a great job in this match, but he's mostly there to be pinned since there was no way Piper was laying down his shoulders. I thought the match of the night was the main event. Piper and Orndorff with Bob Orton out there with them were perfect and drew excellent heel heat. Mr. T was also more than passable in the ring and Hogan was stellar. These were still the early days of Hulkamania and his legend was only growing at this point. Jimmy Snuka was also a great addition to the bout. The worst match of the night was undoubtedly David Sammartino and Brutus Beefcake. It's a total snooze fest until Bruno gets involved, but when the manager is overshadowing the talent, there's a huge problem. <sighs> The MVP of this event, in my opinion, is Roddy Piper. Despite not wanting to lose and having issues with Mr. T, it was the people's hate of Roddy that really sold both this show and Hulk Hogan as a babyface. Piper has said before that without him, there'd be no Hulkamania, and I agree to a point. It would still have happened, but it might not have succeeded as well without such a compelling antagonist. From kicking Cindy Lauper to his promos against Mr. T and Hogan, WrestleMania 1 I don't think succeeds without a villain like Roddy Piper. The best story of the night, I thought, was Andre and John Studd. It was simple to follow and effective in its execution, and I forgot how many people loved Andre as a babyface. My personal pick favorite match of the night is also Andre and John Studd. I was smiling the whole time. I loved it. Everyone from Andre to Studd to Heenan to the commentators and even the fans did their jobs perfectly. After the show, there were closing interviews, the commentators close us out, and then they are actually closing credits at the end of the show, which I found really interesting. And that's WrestleMania 1. It was a massive success and became an annual event. And since there's no WrestleMania 0, we're fast forwarding not a whole decade, but nine years into the future for the 10th event, though not the 10th anniversary of WrestleMania. WrestleMania 10. The 10th WrestleMania needed to be an extravaganza, a celebration of the monumental success of the event. And it certainly was. Between these two shows, Hulkamania had come and gone, we'd seen The Ultimate Warrior rise and fall, WCW started under Ted Turner, and The Undertaker debuted. Ric Flair came and went from the WWF, and a new generation of superstars rose up, led by Bret the Hitman Hart and the Heartbreak Kid Shawn Michaels. The event once more took place at Madison Square Garden, and your commentators for the night were Vince McMahon and Jerry the King Lawler. The show opens with a video package of WrestleMania 1 and pans over the crowd in a style that's a lot more in line with the modern presentation of the product. America the Beautiful is performed by the late Great Little Richard, and we get that awesome retro WrestleMania theme that eventually became Linda McMahon's theme song. The entranceway for this WrestleMania is super small and simple. That's something that would change drastically in the decade to come. It's just a simple series of double doors forming the X logo that's clearly being physically pulled by two people. You still had a lot of managers on the show, but notably fewer. That included Harvey Whippleman, Johnny Polo, who would become Raven in ECW a short time later, Mr. Fuji, Oscar for Men on a Mission, and the man himself, James E. Jim Cornette. This is definitely an early genesis of the product that we have today, with storytelling elements taking place between matches to hype you up. But these eclipse with a Todd Pettingale voiceover, it's still a far cry from the hype videos we have today. At the Royal Rumble that year, Bret Hart and Lex Luger eliminated each other. So does this mean they're doing a triple threat match? Nope. The champion Yokozuna, who is as Japanese as Leilani Kai is Hawaiian, will face Luger first, and then Bret Hart would face off with his brother Owen Hart. Then Bret will meet the winner of Yoko and Lex in the main event. Was it convoluted? Sure. Did it work? Kinda? I mean, it got us the greatest opening match in WrestleMania history, so I'll go with it. Bret Hart and Owen Hart opened the show in an absolute classic bout that's rightly remembered as one of the greatest of all time. Before the match starts, Bret tries to give his glasses to a kid, and he, like, weirdly shoves them on the kid's face, and the kid rejects Bret like he just smeared dog poop on him. It's amazing. Go out of your way to see it. The match is flawless. I find that when brothers wrestle each other, it's either tremendous like this, or it's terrible like any time Matt and Jeff Hardy have faced one another. But this match is stellar, and it even ends with Owen getting a clean win. 
The only thing that wasn't clean in this victory was Owen's mouth, which had a weird white gunk buildup on the side that's really gross, and it's still there in his post-match interview. Did no one tell him to wipe his face? So Brett loses the match, but he's still main event bound later in the night. Then we get Aunt Sperling of the Hair Club for Men putting Howard Finkel in a toupee. This is our first installment of a new ongoing segment, Things That Only Vince Likes. <laughs> where we examine the ridiculously stupid things on WWE TV over the years that popped Vince McMahon and Vince McMahon only. Bam Bam Bigelow, one of my favorites, is on this show in a mixed tag match with Luna Vachon against Doink and Dink. He'd be in the main event just a year later, but that's something we'll talk about next year. Then a weird Bill Clinton lookalike shows up who looks a lot like the former president, but doesn't sound like him. This is yet another edition of... Things that only Vince likes. <laughs> Macho Man Randy Savage makes his last WrestleMania appearance here, facing off with Crush. The match ends with Savage trying and failing to hang Crush upside down. Today, they would have had a whole mechanism in place for this spot. Then we go back to fake Bill Clinton so Vince can belly laugh at how witty he is. And the only takeaway I got here was Todd Pettingill's weird hoop earring. Leilani Kai shows up to battle Alundra Blaze for the women's title, and she's still about as Hawaiian as Yokozuna is Japanese. We got some celebrity guests this year, including Donnie Wahlberg, Rhonda Shear, and Turd Ferguson himself, Burt Reynolds. Yokozuna defeats Lex in a forgettable match with Mr. Perfect Kurt Henning as the guest referee, and then he moves on to face Brett in the main event. This ended the Lex Express for good in the WWE and dropped the Lex Luga as the new Hulk Hogan experiment. We also got a bunch of WrestleMania moments sprinkled through the show narrated by Gorilla Monsoon. This was before the term WrestleMania moment became a cliche, and we'll get to that later. One of the main things this show is remembered for is the stellar ladder match between Shawn Michaels and Razor Ramon, a.k.a. Scott Hall. This match is nearly flawless, and it started Shawn's run as being Mr. WrestleMania. It's hard-hitting and fast-paced, yet it knows when to slow down. In one funny moment, we get to see Shawn's bare ass, and then Kevin Dunn weirdly zooms in on it. But this match was a perfect example of a hard-hitting, high-spot-driven match that also makes sense and felt real. It seemed as though there was supposed to be a 10-man tag on the show, too, that ultimately gets dropped. Then it's time for the main event. Brett and Yoko actually get a video package for the match, but it's god-awful. Rowdy Piper is the guest referee, which I love. He's one of the only people from WrestleMania 1 involved here, and I was glad to see him. The match itself is fine, and Yokozuna is a special talent, but the finish is ridiculous. Yokozuna goes up for the bonsai drop and then just kind of falls off the top rope. And Brett just covers him for the win after that. Why did he fall? What was the point of that? Was he just clumsy? Did the baby faces tranquilize him somehow? I've seen some people here say that the story is that he fought two matches and passed out from exhaustion, and Brett won because of his endurance. But if that was the case, one of the commentators was Vince McMahon, so shouldn't he have put that over? Anyway, Bret Hart wins the world title, and we get a perfect moment with Owen watching on. The babyface locker room empties out and celebrates, and Vince even leaves commentary to go to the ring, which means the show ends in silence, and no one puts over Owen looking on jealously. But then again, Vince is a terrible commentator, so maybe it's better to just let that moment breathe on its own. The match of the night here was really hot to call between the ladder match and Brett versus Owen. I even polled you guys on Twitter X, and the results were super close, but ultimately, I had to give it to the ladder match between Sean and Razor. There was just something special about it. The worst match on the show was Alundra Blaze and Leilani Kai. It was just bad and boring, and the crowd didn't care. The MVP of the night was Shawn Michaels. He worked his tail off out there and started down the road to his legacy. The best story of the night was the ongoing feud between Brett and Owen Hart. Owen winning their match, but Brett winning the title to overshadow the victory was perfect for that rivalry. My favorite match was also Brett and Owen. The story and the match work here were amazing, and it hit for me on every level. All in all, 10 was an average, okay WrestleMania. No Undertaker here, but they proved they could pull down a mania without Hulk Hogan, and that was huge. This was the first WrestleMania without Hogan, and it worked just fine. Now it's time for it all to begin again. Let's turn the clock a full decade forward now to 2004 for WrestleMania 20. Between WrestleMania's 10 and 20, the Monday Night War began and ended, ECW rose and fell, the Austin era started and concluded between WrestleMania's 14 and 19, Shawn Michaels retired and returned, The Rock rose in popularity and then went to Hollywood, DX formed and stopped and reformed, Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan returned to WWE, The Undertaker is now 12-0 at WrestleMania, and we now have both Monday Night Raw and SmackDown along with a roster split and two world titles. Also, a young upstart named John Cena has started to make a name for himself on SmackDown. We're back in Madison Square Garden, and your commentary teams for the night are Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler for Raw, along with Michael Cole and Taz for SmackDown matches. 
The Boys Choir of Harlem is on hand to sing America the Beautiful. There was an awesome retrospective video package on 20 years of WrestleMania that ended with a shot of Vince, Shane, and Shane's newborn son, who is now a major collegiate athlete. You feel old yet? This is super close to the kind of presentation we get today, with a loud opening video and pyro with announcer intros. The stage is massive, with a huge digital cityscape and screens in the floor. It's a precursor to the kinds of massive sets we have today. We open up with, as Michael Cole puts it, SmackDown's fastest rising star in John Cena. He comes out wearing a Knicks jersey, which makes sense given they're in the garden. Fun fact, Cena is a huge Boston Red Sox fan, and despite wearing a hometown jersey in every city they went to, he refused to don a Yankees jersey in New York for years out of his hatred for the team. He eventually caved, however. Of course, that's not a shock. Cena ultimately caves to evil empires all the time. This is John's first WrestleMania, and it was incredible to watch back. I love John Cena. I never understood the hate. I think he's one of the greatest ever, and he proved why here. The crowd is electric as Cena takes on the big show for the U.S. title. There's even Let's Go Cena chants without the accompanying Cena sucks chants. Cena lifting the big show was a huge moment for him, and it helped put him on the trajectory to take the WWE Championship at WrestleMania 21. But we'll talk about that next year. This wasn't just Cena's first mania. It was also the first WrestleMania for Randy Orton and Batista. So this was really the show that kicked off that new era, much like one kicked off the Hogan era and 10 kicked off the new generation era with Brett and Shawn. Starting to notice a trend yet? This was the year the WWE brought back the Hall of Fame and it's been a part of WrestleMania ever since. That was a huge class that included Sergeant Slaughter, Bobby Heenan, Greg Valentine, Tito Santana, and my personal favorite, the Junkyard Dog. Also Pete Rose for some reason. There were a lot of vignettes on this WrestleMania. You had Evolution cutting a promo on the stairwell, and even a vignette where Mean Gene and Bobby Heenan were banging Fabulous Moolah and Mae Young. I'm not kidding. This was also the infamous Brock Lesnar-Goldberg match, with Steve Austin as the referee. Both Brock and Goldberg were leaving WWE after this match, and the crowd knew it. They got the now-defunct You Sold Out chance, which he'd never hear anymore today. The match was atrocious and boring, with the only pop coming from Austin stunning both Brock and Goldberg out of the WWE post-match. What I thought was interesting here was a stare-down moment between Austin and Goldberg. In 1998, that would have made me lose my mind. But in 2004, it was barely a blip in my jaded teenage mind. Eddie Guerrero and Kurt Angle put on a clinic in the WWE Championship match. It's probably the biggest match in Eddie's career, and it was both perfect and memorable. This WrestleMania also mocked the return of The Undertaker as the dead man to face Kane. Taker had spent the better part of four years as the American badass, and people wanted that OG Taker back. They got it here in a big way, complete with Paul Bearer and a recreation of his iconic WrestleMania 14 entrance, which was the last time he faced Kane at the grandest stage of them all, so it makes sense. The main event saw Triple H defend the World Heavyweight Championship against Shawn Michaels and the 2004 Royal Rumble winner Chris Benoit. I realized during the entrances here that we could have had Benoit and Eddie as the main event instead, and that annoyed the crap out of me. Oh, by the way, I think that Chris Benoit is the scum of the earth and a vile, murderous piece of garbage. Don't come at me with CTE. Lots of people have CTE who don't kill their families. That darkness had to be there from the start. As Paul Heyman so eloquently put it, three people died that night and only one had a choice. The match itself is breathtaking, with all three men pulling out all the stops. At the time, I remember losing my mind at Benoit's victory, watching him and Eddie both as world champions and bracing together in the center of the ring. Ugh. It was a moment that gave us all chills, and it was a perfect way to end WrestleMania. Benoit's subsequent title reign would go on to be one of the worst, most forgettable reigns in history, but that's another video for another day. The match of the night here was the main event. It was awesome and had the crowd glued to the ring. Tripp and Sean also had dueling blade jobs that were perfect for more added drama to the match. The worst match of the night was undeniably Brock and Goldberg. What a stinker. It was pure garbage. The MVP of the night for me was Eddie Guerrero. This was a huge night for him, and I couldn't have been happier to see him finally get his due on such a major stage. And his match with Kurt Angle, I'll reiterate, was exceptional. The best story of the night was Kane and The Undertaker. I loved how they built this up for two months with Kane reacting to spooky occurrences like the ring moving without The Undertaker ever showing up. Kane and The Undertaker is the greatest wrestling story ever told, and this was another great chapter in it. My pick of the night was also Kane and The Undertaker. I can't help it. I'm a huge fan of The Dead Man Undertaker, and this match hit perfectly for me. I'm starting to realize that the best story matches are also lining up perfectly with my picks. I guess I like stories. If you're sick of Madison Square Garden, I've got some good news for you. We're about to go forward another decade and to an infinitely bigger event. 
It's WrestleMania 30, and it's coming to the WWE Network for the first time ever in New Orleans, Louisiana, at the Super Dome. Remember that last part, because it gets important in a minute. Between shows, we've seen CM Punk come and go. Cody Rhodes has debuted, but has done absolutely nothing up to this point. John Cena has ruled over the WWE for nine long years. Batista has left for Hollywood and come back. Ric Flair and Shawn Michaels have retired. Triple H is a part-timer now. Brock Lesnar has returned. The Nexus came and went. The anonymous Raw GM and Guest GM of the Week eras are thankfully over. And Vince McMahon beat God in a match. The Undertaker is still undefeated at WrestleMania with 21-0. For now. The commentary team for the evening are Michael Cole, JBL, and a post attitude era Jerry Lawler. Oh dear God, no. The presentation here is just like it is today, with a big, huge opening video and a larger than life feel. The Superdome is a massive open air stadium, and there were more than 75,000 people in attendance. The host of this WrestleMania is Hulk Hogan, and he opens the show coming to the ring to Real American wearing that stupid boa that I freaking hate. Your shoulders don't look that bad, man. Hogan is very clearly nervous in this promo. His hands are shaking, and he calls the Superdome the Silver Dome twice. He catches it the second time when the crowd starts chanting Superdome at him, and he's super embarrassed by it. Then the glass breaks, and out comes Stone Cold Steve Austin. First thing Austin does is mock Hogan over the Silver Dome faux pas. Then he insinuates that he's about to kick Hogan's ass, and the crowd goes nuts. But he doesn't do that. JBL immediately says upon Austin's arrival that he might stun Hogan, which means that he won't. Then The Rock comes out. The announcers start calling this a WrestleMania moment over and over again. I liked WrestleMania moments when they happened organically and breathed on their own. I get that it's a moment. I can feel that it's a moment. Stop telling me it's a WrestleMania moment for two seconds so I can appreciate it for what it is. There's a justified This Is Awesome chant during this promo. The only thing that would have made it perfect would be if Flair was out there too. The Rock cuts a solid promo before insinuating that the very sight of him makes grown men and women want to procreate. (sighs) At this point, if you took a shot every time the announcers said the word moment, you'd be dead. Then we get a beer bash and we end with no stunners. We're 23 minutes into this four and a half hour show now, by the way. Our opener here is Daniel Bryan versus Triple H, with the winner going on to face Randy Orton and Batista in a three-way for the title in the main event. At the time, I was all in on Bryan, but in retrospect, an Evolution three-way would have been an awesome WrestleMania main event. Before the match, we get an amazing retrospective on Daniel Bryan's career, with indie footage in there as well. It's pure perfection, and should be seen by everyone who has ever had a negative thought about this special talent. Triple H gets the big mania entrance here, complete with his throne and king skull. Triple H also has the world's greatest game face, no pun intended. One thing I noticed this time is that Triple H locks Brian in the Crippler crossface and recreates the exact spot that Chris Benoit used to beat him at WrestleMania 20, but Brian gets out of it. That was a cool throwback that a lot of people missed, and honestly, I missed until I watched these two events back to back. Daniel Bryan wins after a solid, solid match and advances to the main event, but Trip injures his shoulder in a post match beatdown. Just masterful storytelling here. We also get some early shield as Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, and their friend squash Kane in the New Age Outlaws. We also get the first ever Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, which gets won by Cesaro in a very impressive way. I can't wait to see how Vince follows up on that huge victory. I sure hope he doesn't do absolutely nothing. Then we get the WrestleMania debut of Bray Wyatt, and he's facing off against the face that runs the place, John Cena. Bray gets an amazing entrance here, yet Cena just walked out like normal, which I found odd. I loved the story that they told here of Bray trying to get Cena to become a monster like him. I always hated that Cena won here, but my co-host on Toonie Talk Wrestling Evil Dose brought up last week that the monster doesn't win in the end, and that made a lot of sense to me and made me feel better about this outcome. Until I remembered that I am a monster. (sighs) Then I just felt sad. The Hall of Fame class comes out next and we get a glimpse of the Ultimate Warrior just days before his untimely death. Ugh. Do I have to talk about this Undertaker match? I guess I do. Before we get into this, here are some Undertaker WrestleMania winning streak fun facts that I found interesting. Every member of Evolution fell to the streak. Shawn Michaels, Kane, and Triple H all fell to the streak multiple times, with Triple H holding the record with three losses to The Undertaker. Alright, have I put this off long enough? (sighs) Fine, let's get into this. So The Undertaker fights Brock Lesnar with Paul Heyman. 
This match blows, and not just because of the finish. There's an eerie silence over the whole match, like the crowd understands that something bad is about to happen. Taker is clearly not alright as the match goes on. He was bludgeoned into a legitimate haze. He's slow and sluggish and gives Brock the worst last ride powerbomb ever. As a result, the match is slow, boring, and borderline unwatchable. Then Brock wins, ending the streak at 21-1. and I can only describe the crowd's reaction as an anti-pop. It's like a pop in reverse. It started at the loudness and then suddenly was just snuffed out as though it never existed. The looks on people's faces tell the whole story. The crowd utterly hates this. The announcers sound completely deflated and chants of bullshit started ringing out. It's a true testament also to The Undertaker's toughness that he was able to get up and walk out under his own power. He ends up going to the hospital after this match. What an absolute turd. And the crowd never recovers. I truly believe they're still sluggish in the main event because of this. We get a vignette with Hogan and Mean Gene, which I believe might be the last ever on-screen meeting between Roddy Piper and Hulk Hogan. Piper and Paul Orndorff confront Mr. T and Hulk Hogan in the back, along with Pat Patterson in a ref outfit, and they all shake hands. Piper even swallows his vomit long enough to shake Mr. T's hand. This vignette struck me because 10 years later, Piper, Orndorff, Mean Gene, Pat Patterson, and the concept of Hulkamania are all dead. Mean Gene, of course, ruins the whole thing by telling us all that it's a WrestleMania moment. Now it's main event time. Randy Orton gets the big live band entrance, but Batista doesn't even get his pyro. The crowd is so solidly behind Daniel Bryan. Orton and Batista work the shoulder for the whole match, and it gets over huge. Tripp and Steph try to interfere and eat a suicide dive for it. In the end, the right thing is done, and Bryan taps out Batista to win the world title. The sight of the entire 75,000-plus crowd doing the yes point while confetti falls is definitely amazing to watch. Brian's sister and niece even join him in the ring at the end. But the celebration definitely goes on a little too long. I think he starts and stops the yes chant like five times. But that closes WrestleMania 30. The match of the night was the main event. All three guys pulled out all the stops, and they partially woke the crowd up from their Undertaker Brock-induced coma. The worst match of the night was Undertaker and Brock, and it wasn't even close. The MVP of the night was Daniel Bryan. The dude worked his ass off in two stellar matches for one of the most memorable nights in pro wrestling history. It was a feel-good moment that none are soon to forget. The best story was Cena and Bray Wyatt. I loved the psychological warfare and how unnerved Cena was by Bray. And of course, that means Marvin's pick for WrestleMania 30 is Cena and Bray Wyatt. I loved it, and I could watch that match again at any time. And there you have it. Four shows encompassing 29 years of an evolving and shifting pro wrestling business. What I found interesting was that each of these shows ushered in a new era. Hogan with 1, the new gen with 10, the OVW kids in 20, and the modern era with 30. 10, 20, and 30 each ended with a workhorse fan favorite Stella in-ring competitor winning the title. However, each was immediately followed by an abysmal title reign. Brett's win ushered in one of the lowest periods in WWE history where the company got whooped by Eric Bischoff and nearly went under. Benoit was a lame duck champion with forgettable reign that was done by SummerSlam. Brian got injured almost immediately and was forced to vacate the title. It'll be interesting to see what happens this weekend with another workhorse fan favorite going up against the established champion. A lot has changed between WrestleMania 30 and 40. Vince McMahon has left the company. The WWE was sold to a corporate entity. AEW rose as a challenger brand. Cody Rhodes became a star. CM Punk returned. Roman Reigns found his niche. The Rock came back again. John Cena went to Hollywood. WrestleMania became a two-night affair. The company started to hire more wrestlers from outside the US. The women's revolution changed the face of female wrestling. NXT became its own brand. The women made event at WrestleMania, Triple H and Shawn Michaels took over the WWE, and most importantly, 2D Town Wrestling started up. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this annual WrestleMania retrospective future that we're hoping to do every year. For early access to videos, check out patreon.com slash Wrestling, where you'll get face lock features and song parodies early, along with exclusive content. Check back later in the week for the Headlock Headlines, a new song parody, and a WrestleMania 40 results-focused face lock feature. Please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Click the bell icon to get notified of new videos as they drop. For all of us here at Toonytown Wrestling, I'm Marvin the Movie Monster. Now get out of here!